Wait, where? What? Give me the box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. <laughs> With your host, Daniel Clark. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Escape the Zoo Podcast, where we talk everything wildlife. Today's guest is the first time that we have ever had a second time guest, and it's Jeremy Hans, a journalist with experience writing about wildlife, climate change, energy politics, animal behavior, conservation, and so much more for outlets like Manga Bay and The Guardian. We have a really interesting conversation that spans across a bunch of different topics, from the concept of the reintroduction of the Malayan tapir into Borneo, to the recent scandal and allegations against the WWF, to the conservation status of Sumatran rhinos. We also discuss his brand new column with Manga Bay, entitled Saving Life on Earth, Words on the Wild, where he has written and is going to continue to write a bunch of really interesting articles. I'll link it in the show notes. I highly recommend you check them out. We also discussed them a bit in the podcast. I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. So without further ado, here it is, my conversation with the one and only Jeremy Hans. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for taking the time. This is a big moment on the Escape the Zoo podcast. You are officially our first recurring guest. Wow. I'm very uh, I'm very honored to be your first recurring guest. Thanks no, for having me. Thanks yeah, for having me again. It's exciting, and I'm super thankful to you because for listeners, Jeremy has literally introduced me to so many amazing people that have come on the podcast from Dr. Jody Rowley to Niall McCann, uh, Greg McCann. And then yesterday I actually just recorded with, uh, Bill Roby show. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, cool. But the Sawa. Oh my God. So interesting. That's going to be a great one. Yeah. He's such an interesting guy. And I always use that phrase. Uh, you ever hear like, if it's not me, then who? He's like yeah. the epitome of that. It's like yeah. The, yeah. Enti- I, the entire Saula species, he's basically taken on his back and is try- trying to help make sure that they're around forever. Yeah, and that's one of the amazing things I always find about some of these conservationists, especially ones who pick this one species that they devote their life to. I'm like, I my brain is like too scattered and I get, I just get, you know, one day I'm interested in this and the next day I'm interested in that. But these people can like focus on a region and an animal and laser like, and then they can be responsible potentially for, you know, saving a species. And I'm always like, how do you, that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Especially when it's not even like near where you grew up or where you're from. I I was recording with him and he was at his home in Wisconsin and he's like, and I was like, Oh, so when's your next trip? He's like, Oh, I'm leaving on Monday. So I actually have to jump off this podcast so I can go back and he's back over to Laos for who knows how long, but pretty yeah. exciting news. He's going over there right now to meet, I believe with both the Laos and Vietnam government, they're starting that captive breeding program for them, which amazing. is super, super exciting. Yeah. I'll be so interested to see how it turns out. Cause that's such a, it's such an exciting time and such a risky time when you're, when you try and go and capture these large animals that no one's ever really yeah. you know, been able to keep um, alive in captivity for very long. So it'd be really cool to see kind of, uh, I think I really the hope. longest they've kept one alive in captivity is like three weeks. And the scary yeah. thing is there, that one, it was the one that he was able to spend three weeks with like 20 years ago. And he's spent mm-hmm. more time with a Sala than any other Westerner, uh, it didn't show any signs of distress, which is kind of scary. Like it was just totally normal. And then three weeks later it passed and she died. He told me another story where, uh, some, I don't know if they were poachers or illegal loggers were up there and had actually, uh, snared one of the, yeah, I think they were poachers. They had snared one of the Sala, but he's him and his working group have done such a good job as to kind of helping the community feel, like these are special creatures that are theirs. I mean, they can be found mm-hmm. nowhere else that they actually like put it in a little enclosure and, and didn't kill it like they normally would. Oh, and yeah. they came back and he was able to get back up there because it was two days hike from town and take the measurements and be with it. But then it died like two days later. So it's just Oof. this, it's kind of scary when you're 
dealing with such small populations that you're like, okay, the, the breeding population is probably too small to survive, but we can't yeah. keep any of them in captivity for more than three weeks, let alone make yeah. sure that like everybody knows how hard it was to finally figure out how pandas start breeding. Yeah. Uh, so it's just like, it, it's, it's going to take, you know, and I think that's one thing that for people who follow this story to remember is that it takes a lot of trial and error. And, um, if it, we look at the past, like, uh, if the Sawa program is going to be successful, you have to kind of give these people some benefit of the doubt and be patient and realize there might be some of the animals that don't make it right away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we just have to be kind of, you have to kind of be ready for that. Um, and it's a desperate enough situation. And I, and I really trust the people who are on the ground who have been working with this animal for so long. It's desperate enough that like now is the time. This is our only chance. Yeah. Um, captive breeding to potentially be a, an option here. And if there is no captive breeding, then the chance of this animal surviving, you know, goes down considerably. Yeah. And it's, it's something where he's like, it's so hard to find any evidence of these, but Back 20 years ago, he was using film cameras and had four to 10 of these camera traps out there. And he still could get a camera trap photo once in a while, whereas sure. now they have 300 and they barely ever get them. So he mm. thinks there's like less than 100. It's probably even a little bit more dismal than that. So, yeah, but I guess what they're looking at is the Munt Jacks out there are somewhat mm -hmm. similar. So I think they're going to start trying to captive breed the Munt Jacks and kind of get a vibe as to and how the whole is, process works. Is that the giant Munt Jack? Uh, I don't know. It's called or some kind, I don't remember the name of the species, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, they have a, a few, I guess, one of his colleagues who he's uh, introduced me to, do you know Robert Timmons? Yes. Yeah, so apparently this dude is like the he's, king of discovering new species. Yeah, he's crazy. <laughs> um, but uh, he just discovered a new type of muntjac that's now critically yeah. endangered. But I think the population is, or I know it's better than the, the Sala. So yeah. I think they might try starting with some of those or maybe a muntjac population that's a little healthier. But I always just think it's amazing when you hear about the new species that people discover like, but it tends to be like frogs or bacteria or, mm -hmm. or, or can bacteria be species that might've sounded dumb, but frogs or no, in, I think, insects. I think it can be, are, depending on how you kind of like, there's a big, I think a debate right now about how bacteria fits. Into, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I just, else. I said, it and I was like, that may, might make me sound dumb, um, <laughs> <laughs> but frogs and insects. And, and that's incredibly cool. I mean, I talked to, uh, Dr. Jody Rowley about that forever. And I thought her work was unbelievably fascinating, but to find out that there was a 200 pound mammal just hanging out in Southeast Asia that nobody knew about until the 1990s yeah, is insane. It was one of the biggest discoveries of like, the, you know, for mammals of the entire century. I mean, it was, it was huge. And I, and it's, what's kind of interesting. And I think somewhat sad is like, I still think, Oh, you know, most people would never have heard of that animal. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, most of us, we, you know, and I think I only heard of it when I became an environmental journalist, really. And I was obsessed with animals, but it was just, <laughs> right. you know, it's one of those things where the environmental news doesn't always sort of <laughs> filter up, unfortunately, to the top as it, as at least I think it should be higher up in the, in the media's prominence than it is. Yeah. And I think the same way I've always been obsessed with animals, but until I started doing the podcast and talking to folks on a consistent basis, I've been almost embarrassed as to, <laughs> it's crazy. Like yeah. I, I genuinely probably know like 15% of the megafauna that are around and it's not, we're not talking like the small little animals. Yeah. Like I talked to Greg McCann, he started listing off all these cats that he's uh, camera trapped up in yeah. Sumatra and in, in Cambodia. And I was like, never heard of that. Never heard of yeah. that. Never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, <It's laughs> and wild. I'm starting to Google them and I'm like, holy shit, these are yeah. beautiful animals, like big, like lesser cats and, uh, different types of bears I'd never heard about. And you start thinking about it and it's really your average person knows like maybe 20 of these species when there's hundreds of them. Yeah. That's so true. And you're someone who's really interested in it too. And that, <laughs> yeah. and I was the same way when I started this, you know, and that was part of the fun of being an environmental journalist is, is just like, Oh my God, every day is a new discovery. You know, every day you're learning about something wild and different and new that you never knew about. And you're like, this is, it's crazy. And it's, you know, and, and it's somewhat uplifting. What's, you know, that some of these things are still there and we still have a chance. And I think it's important to, to try and get that into the world because 
to me, it's so motivating to be like, if there's a 200 pound mammal that nobody knew about, what else is there out there? And likely if we don't know about it, it is in pretty dire situation. Yeah. Especially Um, if it's a mammal, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, But I guess that guy, Robert Timmons, he discovered, it, it made me think of our first conversation where he discovered a species of animals that was a completely new genus of mammal. Mm. And I, I think it's some type of rodent. I, I, yes. Yeah. I uh, think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I can't remember the pronunciation, but yeah. It made me this, think of the Selenodon is it in, conversation. Is it, in Lao? Uh, it is. Yes. I believe. Yeah. yeah. That was a bonkers discovery too. Yeah. And it is, it is similar in that, that way that you can have, you know, and this is a smaller animal and maybe not so charismatic. Um, but it's, uh, it's wild what's still out there and it's wild what we don't know about. And that was something I think he discovered like literally in like a market <laughs> being sold. Oh, um, that's... maybe <laughs> potentially that's a lot of, that's a lot of where discoveries are made in, um, Southeast Asia mm. is you can go to these markets and you can find things, um, that are just being sold for food often, um, or medicine or something like that. Um, and then, you know, it's something you can take it to your lab and you find out, Oh my God, this is something different that we've never seen. That I can't imagine how exciting that must be, especially if that's kind of your focus for your life's work. I mean, yeah. they were saying the sow law was discovered when a biologist was just walking through Laos and walked into some villager's house and saw this skull with these two massive horns coming off of it. And he's like, what is that? And yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, that lives here. And you're like, oh, that didn't come from Africa. And they're like, no, we got that. And there's still like a little bit of flesh on the skull. And you're like, holy shit, <laughs> what is going on right now? Yeah, it's, that's so true. And that's that's kind of the, the wildness of, I, I imagine, being a biologist, you know, is, um, yeah, so I think the species that you're talking about, just to, just to throw this in there, it, yeah. I'm, I'm going to pronounce this totally wrong, but uh, Ka Nuao, <laughs> okay. or something like that. And it was discovered in an Asian food market in Laos. Wow, um, so interesting. Yeah. And it's a, it was a totally new, like, it was something that no one had ever seen. Um, and uh, so, yeah. What does it look so like? People I need look, to... it, look it up. It's actually kind of cute. It's got, like, a little furry tail, like a chipmunk almost. And, oh. I mean, I find I find rat-like animals cute. So, I don't, <laughs> you know, maybe, like, other people would be like this. But it's got this kind of elongated face. Um, and, you know, it does have sort of a rat-like look, but smaller ears uh, and yeah. So anyway, check it uh, out, people. Yeah, I'll up. I'll link to it in the show notes. I I get what you're saying. Like I've definitely seen some types of rodents that I'm like, that's cuter than other. Like some like yeah. especially like desert mice sometimes are oh, cute. Oh god, some of those are like gerboas. I don't know. Uh, yeah. If, if, look up if you don't know gerboa audience. <laughs> Google gerboa fluff balls. It's the cutest thing you've ever seen. Oh, I'll li- I'll link to that in the show notes too. Um, yeah, because but there's something about a rat that I've just never been able to get over. I think it has to do with the frequency that you're scared that they might come into your life. I think like sure. I lived in the dirty, gross college dorm <laughs> way, when I was 20 years old where you're always worried, like you hear that scuttering and you're like, I know something's in my apartment. I'm just hoping it's one of the little ones and not, not one of the big ones. It's interesting because I think one of the one of the things that made me like more appreciative of rodents and rats and just their ability to survive is I lived in New York City for a year. And we would just like, you'd go down to the park in the middle of the, you know, like late at night and you'd be hanging out, listening to music. And then you just see these rats like coming <laughs> up and people are like tossing them bits of food. Or you'd be on the, the you know, the subway, um, waiting for the subway and you just see rats like skittering around, you know, and you're like, holy, like these things are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, they're, and, and yes, you know, um, you can blame, you know, well, actually, you know, rats are not responsible for the black death. That was the fleas. But um, you know, yeah, it's not great to have them running around your house and I can understand people's aversion to them. But for me, it's, I, I have a sort of a very fascination with rodents. Yeah. Well, it's all context, about, right? It's like, yeah. if it's in your house, you hate it. But there was that, that rat that went viral a couple of weeks ago. Did you see this in Norway? I think it was, where is this really fat rat that got stuck in a storm drain? Did you see this? No, I didn't see it. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, you have to check it out. Uh, okay. basically it was this cute little rat and it got stuck because it was like way too fat in one of the storm drains, but it was, it looked just because it was now in a vulnerable position and it wasn't in your house and it was a little obese. It was just so <laughs> cute. And it was making its way around the internet just because people thought it oh, was. Oh yes, I did. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That's it's awesome. Really and funny. sad. Like, oh, I hope uh, they saved him. Oh, it says but, they did save him. Okay, good. But on the other end of the spectrum, not just to keep going on, I'm, no. I'm on a podcast talking about things that people can't watch, but there was a video of, and this is kind of on the dark side where I think rats are kind of sure. creepy. There's a video, I think it was in Asia, of this group of rats that basically evolved to develop this behavior where they could run together in such a group that they looked like a snake. It was like, oh my God. Oh, That's it's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome, but it is <laughs> very it, creepy yeah. to look at. It's literally like 20 rats and they'll run through the street and they, they, even go in kind of a zigzaggy pattern, but it literally looks like a snake. And then they zoom in and you're like, holy shit, that's 25 rats. Wow. What an incredible commentary though on the, on the rapidness and amazingness of ad- ad- adaptability. Like that's bonkers. It's crazy. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Uh, but to, to draw a parallel on something that has changed since our first conversation, we spent a lot of time talking about the Sumatran rhino, which similarly to, The Saula is this incredibly unique species where there's less than 100 left in the world and people hardly ever see them. So you really don't have a sense as to what the population size is like. And likely it's too small to be uh, a sustainable breeding population. So captive breeding is likely the solution. But when we were talking about it, it was just after WWF had come in and Mm -hmm. tried to to capture one that i think had Mm -hmm. already been slightly injured i might be wrong about that uh this is najak and she passed away yeah i think it was yeah and Um, and, wait sorry go ahead uh i'm just trying to think of one uh so there so there was one um that died and her name was najak and then there's one that they have caught since then yeah so that's Um, what i wanted to talk about because i think we talked literally right before the second one got caught so i've been kind of trying to stay attuned to, I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit after we talked about them because I think similarly to how most people think, I was a little ignorant to the fact that you hear the word Sumatran rhino, and we talked about this before, but I hate when animals have the name of the location where they were found and not necessarily sure. their range because to me I was like, oh, it's just an Indian rhino yeah. that happens to live in Sumatra which is yeah. completely wrong. And I started looking at them and they're these cute little hairy rhinos that just wallow in the mud all day and sing to each other in the forest. And I was like, mm-hmm. these are the most beautiful animals I've ever seen. And uh, so I was really excited to hear that they had a successful captive breeding um, experience. But I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the details there. because Yeah, didn't... no, no, that's great. So basically um, they had this, this, so what happened is there's um, a pop, you know, the populations that we know of the larger populations are today in Sumatra, but they're, they discovered about uh, 10, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Well, then, no, not that long, for, uh, probably like five years ago, they discovered a small surviving population in Borneo, okay. uh, in Indonesian Borneo and Kalimantan. And they've been monitoring these. There's basically uh, at one time, I think there was three individuals that they knew of and they were monitoring them very closely. Um, I think one has since gone off their radar or perhaps died. Um, and then they captured Najak and for very complicated reasons. And, um, some, I I mean, I've heard some different things and sort of the official story was maybe a little different than what the, what really happened. But basically Najak, when they captured her, she had had a snare trap. She Mm -hmm. had had a snare injury and snare injuries, especially in Southeast Asia, whether it's a Sala or Sumatran rhino is so common. (laughs) Um, a lot of these animals uh, grow up with having, you know, things that they've been caught in. And if they survive that, then it's amazing. But they, you know, they're injured. So she she had an injury, um, but she only she did not live. Um, and but then since then, I believe it was last like November. Yeah, in late November, they caught the other one that they've been monitoring, uh, Pahu, and uh, successfully caught. And she is uh, still around. Um, what is this? This is maybe four or five months later now. Um, and she's being kept in Indonesian Borneo in a, uh, you know, facility that they basically built for this. Um, and I mean, I guess my question for this, what what I think is interesting here. So she's in Borneo, Mm -hmm. but the facility that's actually doing the captive breeding is in Sumatra. Okay. And so I thought it was Cincinnati for some reason. Isn't it? Yeah. No, Cincinnati was very, very involved and Cincinnati was who cracked the code and how to get these animals to breed because their breeding was so different than any other rhino. Got it. And so the first, the first born, 
captive bred Sumatran rhino in the wild, or in captivity in like a, over a hundred years was in Cincinnati. Um, okay. and that was, I think 2001, if I remember correctly. Um, and his name was Andalus and he's still around. Uh, and then they had three babies in Cincinnati and then they have since had two babies in Sumatra in a facility in Way Canvas National Park, which I've visited. Um, and so I think the question now is, you know, they have this female in Borneo, in Indonesia, but if they just keep her in Borneo <laughs> in a facility, like to me, that just sounds absolutely, that sounds pointless. Why do you have a female? Yeah. And keep her there. So my, my guess is that once she gets, uh, acclimated, once they are able to see um, what her breeding capacity is, they could either send her to Sumatra where they have a number of males that are um, potentially fertile. Okay. Um, they also have another male in Sabah in Malaysian Borneo named Tam, um, though his fertility is probably not as good and he's on the, on the older side, but they could potentially send her to mate with him. But I, my sense is of this is, and, and I haven't heard anything, you know, and this is sort of me speculating, but my, my hope is that she would be sent somewhere where she could be bred as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. Is she older? I, I don't know. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff kind of gets to be, and for some good reason, is sort of hush hush. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Until they're ready to sort of say, you know, until they release an official statement. Um, and this this capture was done by WWF, and is, there's a new um, kind of a new con uh, co coalition working with the Sumatra Rhino, which is WWF, National Geographic, um, uh, International Rhino Foundation, and a few other groups have sort of built this new coalition, which uh, their set goal is basically to go out and capture more rhinos, and um, and, and that would be in Sumatra. That would be in places like Way Canvas, uh, potentially in Aceh, which is in the northern part of Sumatra. Um, potentially in a in another wild uh, national park called Bukit Barisan, though the question is if, if no one really knows if there are actually any rhinos left there, and if there uh -huh. are, it's just a few individuals. So the idea is to go and catch more rhinos to do a to do a bigger breeding population. And I mean, at least in the last couple of weeks, basically what I've heard is people are kind of like waiting for that to happen still. And there's I think some people who are who maybe don't aren't in the know, but are people are kind of getting antsy, being like, okay, the whole point was to catch rhinos. Why aren't we hearing about that starting? Um, and yeah. it may be that the training is just take takes a while or I mean, I hope that it's not an issue where the government has got cold feet again. Um, yeah, it's that's always, that's always the concern. Um, yeah, it's also just it's such a I hate to sound like I'm, I'm a what is that phrase when you're repeating yourself all the time? Beating a dead horse. Yeah, beating a dead horse. But yeah. it's kind of a messed up saying when I think about <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't think I'll use that anymore. Uh, but I still think the concept is so strange that because of these borderlines of countries that we set hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. that the animals that fall within those borders, which are usually not necessarily the top priority of any government official who's trying to take yeah. care of the welfare of his people or her people or their people, <laughs> Just making sure I get my bases covered there. There you um, go. Uh, the basically the the longevity of this beautiful gift to the world of this entire species of animals is in the hands of a few people who probably don't have it as a particularly high priority. So whether they yeah. want to do captive breeding or just let the species die out in the rainforest, it's kind of yeah. not up to anybody but these few people who have. Yes. a lot of things on their plate. So it's a very yeah. strange concept. It, it is a strange concept. And, you know, they're going to get advice. Uh, hopefully they'll be getting good advice from the various NGOs. But then the NGOs have to play this game, too, of, you know, making sure that they're, they're on good terms with the government and not pushing too hard, but, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And and so it makes a really complicated uh, – sometimes – and it depends on the different governments. and depends on who's in charge at what time. But it can be a very frustrating, long – process and it can i mean i think that in some ways it can lead um obviously to animals getting worse and worse or in, you know heading to extinction without action being taken and that's where the fear is i think um you know so i was really heartened when i heard that pahu was captured um and successfully captured and the fact that she's still alive this many months later i would assume is 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 good now it's possible she may be too old for breeding but we i mean i just haven't heard you know what her age is and what her potential is and and um, you know, and but 
even if she's potentially too old for breeding, there's there's possibility that she could be, you know, that there are advanced sort of techniques that could be done to attempt to still make her useful within the breeding population. So right. we'll have to just kind of wait and see, and hopefully somebody will let us, you know, we'll, that will kind of, but my, my, my guess is that we'll suddenly hear like, oh, she's been airlifted to Sumatra or she's been moved to a different facility or, you know, or maybe, you know, it is possible too that maybe they're trying, they're keeping their, they think that there's maybe some males still in the area. But oh, um, interesting. Last I heard that was, that was probably not the case. I don't think that there was any other rhinos that they had a secure, secure eye on. So I don't, I don't want to pry too much because I understand that there's sensitivities to your work in doing this, but I, I have to ask because of the way you kind of glossed over it a little bit. You said that there was kind of some uh, hush, hush, Sure. Not yeah. not positive exactly what happened with the first capture where the rhino died. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit there? Um, yeah. Uh, so basically, I wrote an article about this. I did a, a series on the Sumatran rhino for Manga Bay. And um, there I was able to sort of, and I'm trying to remember exactly what I was able to divulge. Um, but basically, there, there was some contention that... Um, so when you catch a large animal like this, mm -hmm. uh, there's very strict protocol about like how long it's supposed to be kept in uh, the 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 initial capture pen, what kind of um, you know what you're, how you're supposed to how quickly you're supposed to get it to a different area, and there was some criticism that perhaps she had been kept too long, um, uh, okay. in the initial capture pen, um, and this is this is actually from a report that I found online to uh, for WWF. So like this wasn't even like hush hush conversation like i found this uh and so but the, this what hadn't been reported in the news because again it, you know you have to kind of go dig for some of this stuff and i had yeah. I, I, I had been doing a lot of digging and talking to a lot of people and then there was there was some controversy about whether or not she had been given the right medications or over medicated now you know that is a really tough call for any kind of veterinarian working with uh, a large animal like this um, and I've, I've met some vets and they're wonderful people and they do their job amazingly. But like, you know, when you have an animal that's going into stress or looking like it could die and it's one of the last, like you, I mean, I don't think there was any kind of, you know, there was obviously no kind of maliciousness or anything like that. There might've been some mistakes made, certainly. Yeah. Um, and there might've been some misorganization or some, some bad decisions made. I think that that's probably pretty possible. Um, but again, this is the difficulty and the challenge of catching large animals, um, on the ground and having to have a plan in place that is going to, you know, uh, be the best chance for that animal. And sometimes you're catching animals that have already been, you know, that are already, you know, not, not, are already maybe sick or old. And no matter what you do, the animal is going to be stressed, right? right? The animal is going to be scared and stressed, um, and fearful. So, you know, I think that they really do the best work, and I'm really heartened by the fact that Pahu was captured and is still around. It's really sad what happened with Najak, but I'm, it, you know, maybe they learned their lessons on some of those mistakes. Um, but yeah, I think that the, I think that some things went wrong, but I think we also have to remember just what a challenge this is yeah. and how difficult. So and I, I also think animals kind of. I think it's hard to understand what it means to die from stress, and I, I didn't yeah. totally understand that until my brother got a, a dog who I'm obsessed with about a year and a half ago. And when it was a puppy, um, my brother had to go on like a three day work trip and his fiance was still with the dog the entire time. But the dog got like incredibly sick and was like vomiting and like doing mm. all this stuff just because he was so like sad and stressed out that my brother wasn't there. And then you're like, wow, I've never heard of a human doing that, but I can understand what this stress is. But on the other yeah. side of it, too, like I also get your point where obviously nobody has any malintention around what they're doing, but there needs to be a focus on the fact that this is one of who knows how many, less than 100, probably less than 50 of these animals left in the world that yeah. we need to be going to like astronomical levels to protect them. Like I, I go back to the style law that uh, Bill was talking about where uh, it died within three weeks of being in captivity. And he said they had a vet out there like couple days before who was like, yeah, it looks like maybe not a couple days, but recently before it was like, yeah, it's okay. And yeah. I don't know. I think if I'm dealing with 
the 40th left in the world that there should probably be 24 seven monitoring on these things. It's just, it's yeah. too important. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah. Oh yeah, let's do a quick and, physical and, my, and then bounce. You know, my, 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 at least with NASDAQ, I'm, I'm sure there was 24 hour monitoring. I think some of the concern there was that there may have been so many people involved and mm-hmm. so many decisions being made that it was hard to make a real clear cut decision and have someone be responsible. Um, you know, and that's, that can be a difficulty, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, and, and with the cell law, I don't know what kind of monitoring they had, but that was such a different situation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas this is like, this was an intentional capture. They were all ready. They knew. And then, um, you know, it just, it went badly and, uh, it's, it's a terrible tragedy. Um, yeah, the cell law was in like some guy's makeshift zoo. It, it, yeah, it wasn't, exactly, it wasn't exactly. anything remotely close to what's going on yeah. there. My big concern yeah. is just like what's going on with WWF in general. I think I I'm not I don't know much about a lot of these stories and it's such a large NGO that it's hard to you don't want to demonize the entire thing, but I think this is something you can understand like it's it's new capturing sure. a rhino, etc. but I was talking to Niall McCann on the podcast and he's like he's like listen, we have evidence of some really messed up stuff that has been going on that WWF's been slightly a part of in Africa. And I was like, that's strange. And like, you, but you, it's such a well-respected place that you take it with a, uh, you pay attention to it, but you're like, yeah. all right, like there. And then all of a sudden the Leonardo DiCaprio thing comes out where they're talking about all these human rights violations that yep. WWF is a part of, which I, and I, that's, I yeah, I, I just, no, I, I, I honestly, I'm not super, super familiar with it, but you just hear all these stories and you're like, that always to me seemed like the trademark number one place where if I didn't know where to donate my money, I should be giving it to them. And now all of a sudden I'm hearing all these dark stories, which may be a minority of the problem, but it may not be, you know what I mean? No, it's not a minority. of the (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I've been writing and I wrote a, I wrote a big series on this about uh, in Manga Bay, I think three, four years ago on sort of big conservation. And, And that included sort of WWF conservation international, um, and uh, the Nature Conservancy, which are sort of the three largest. Um, and there has been a lot of, uh, so the funny thing is, is you take conservationists out, you know, you, you hang out with them for a while at like a, uh, maybe a symposium or a conference. And, you know, when they start to talk about these organizations, it starts to get real, <laughs> yeah. real controversial and critical. Um, and not every time I've heard some people say very good things. And I think part of the problem is, is WWF is so big. It works in so many countries and it's working in some of the most God awful, difficult places to work mm-hmm. in the world. But, um, if you, there's a, there's some, a new series on Buzzfeed that's highlighting the human rights, um, allegations, uh, across central Africa and in places like, um, Nepal and things like this. And this is stuff that I've been hearing about for years. Can you elaborate um, a little bit as to like what that means, the human rights violations? So, yeah. What it means is basically WWF. Okay. So you're working in a country like, uh, let's say like the, the democratic Republic of the Congo, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the DRC, which is one of the most conflict prone, po- impoverished, unstable countries. Um, you know, it's not a place that I would readily <laughs> go, although it has an incredible amount of nature. So you're working in one of the most difficult places. Um, and, what WWF will do is they will work with the government and they will get, they will support forest guards, right? Forest rangers out there. Um, but the problem that what, what happens is sometimes these forest rangers, there might be tribal differences. Like the forest rangers might be working with a community that they see as inferior to them due to ethnic or tribal differences, Mm -hmm. or they might just, they might just be trained in really militia kind of techniques. Um, or they might just be, you know, uh, not have gotten the correct protocol and they will do some sometimes some pretty horrible things uh and this is i I should i should uh, paraphrase this this is all alleged stuff this is right right you know but there's there's a group called survival international which has been working within indigenous communities for i think 50 years and they're the ones that are one of the ones that are kind of gathering a lot of these stories over the last few years um but there's a lot of stories of uh abusing people burning down people's houses um uh torture even potentially murder of of various forest guards and rangers that have worked within the WWF confines. Now, again, these forest rangers are often linked to the government, um, but they're like trained by WWF or WWF has a stake in them. Um, and we shouldn't paint everybody with a broad brush either, too, because being a ranger out there in these kinds of countries 
where there are elephant poachers with AK-47s. Like that's one of the hardest, most difficult jobs on the planet. I mean, you are putting your life on the line. So it gets really complicated and messy. But uh, there are some credible allegations that have come out about the what some forest rangers in particular countries have um, and their leadership have been doing. Uh, and basically just, you know, again, like def- like breaking human rights <laughs> laws and violations. And and they're doing it under um, the the uh, you know, they're doing it under sort of the umbrella, you could say, of WWF because WWF is connected, directly connected to this, to these programs. Right. So I will be interested, interested to see uh, what kind of oversight starts to come in play, how WWF responds. But, you know, this is my own personal opinion, but in the past, what happens with WWF often is they are so concerned with their image. They're so concerned with the preservation of their, um, of how they look to the world and how they're viewed that they they tend to sort of criticism tends to disappear <laughs> with and 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 they their things get swept under the rug and that has always concerned me about WWF. Yeah, um, you said it. You know, no, no, but I, I also just want to say, like WWF has has does many wonderful things. It has lots of great programs. I am in touch with a lot of conservationists who I think do incredible work and work directly. You know, our WWF employees. So I don't want to say that this is. But they, I think they clearly have a system systemic problem, mm-hmm. um, and I think they need to deal with it. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I think the difficulty is is it's an incredibly nuanced situation to the point of what you were saying, where it's hard to understand, and it's very country specific. It's very even location specific within countries. Yeah. But you look at folks like um, I watched that documentary Virunga about oh, yeah. the, the park rangers in Virunga National Park who are protecting the gorillas out there. And it's not the concept of what a park ranger is in America compared to what a park mm-hmm. ranger is in Virunga <laughs> National Park. I mean, th- these guys are going to war every day yeah. for these gorillas, yeah. like with yeah. guns, they're yeah. dying. Like it's a yeah. real situation. And then yeah. on the other side of the spectrum, like the poaching epidemic in, in Africa, it, it, like, ivory for the rhino horn like those are also very nuanced uh country to country and unfortunately like a lot of the people who are ultimately doing the actual killing of these animals are not necessarily the most evil people in the world it's just that they're in these incredibly tough situations and like frankly like if i was struggling to put food on the table and my kids were starving and like i was in a tough socioeconomical place I can understand like how when somebody comes in and they're like, Hey, like we'll take care of this for you. If you do this for me, like I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying I can understand that stuff. And and, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say like when, when you're dealing with these things, I get even a little anxious myself when I talk to certain people on the podcast and you hear about these NGOs that a lot of their work is border protection. A lot of their work is working in communities to help, with some kind of grassroots efforts to protect these animals. But there is a division in many of these big nonprofits who do very important work that is military based, like it's guns, it's, it's, it's intense. And to me, like, I know for a fact, I am not educated enough on which, uh, what the right protocols are to solve this. Like, like what, like, when people are getting killed versus when people are getting arrested versus like, what is the extent to which you go in all these situations? And it, it's scary to think about. Cause like, I worry about promoting a nonprofit who's doing things that ultimately are not good for the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, oh yeah, totally. And I think the only, because I know I will not be educated on that to the fullest extent that I could ever make a decision as to what's right or wrong. You place your faith in the fact that the organizations that are the biggest in the world or that understand it on a grassroots level the most understand those nuances better than you. So if I mm-hmm. want to help the elephants, I can donate to them, but they're going to be doing it the right way. And unfortunately, when some of these organizations get so big or they start losing grasp of what those nuances are and not seeing things through, all of a sudden that faith goes out the window. And now you're like, yeah, I'm just scared as to like what I could possibly be donating to. And I mean, that was what Niall McCann was talking about. He's like, all of a sudden, like, yeah, there's four helicopters that WWF 
donated, but then they didn't see who was using the helicopters and now they're doing, <laughs> they're, yeah. they're not being and now they're doing, Yeah. And, and sometimes they're doing that bad stuff at the behest of the government. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, and, and not WWF, but they'll be using WWF equipment. Um, and so like, and it also gets troubling because, you know, again, WWF, uh, I think to their credit is working in places that are very difficult and they're entering not just, you know, war zones of, of poachers, but also ethnic complexities and ethnic uh, racism that's on the ground. So like in, for example, in Cameroon, they have forest guards there. And for years, there's been these allegations that the forest guards in Cameroon are basically uh, uh, abusing and destroying the homes of uh, the indigenous Baca people who live in the forest. Mm -hmm. um, and and so that that's like one of those things where like there's this ethnic, uh, you know, the, the indigenous or the people – you know, the, the, the tribal tribes in Cameroon who are hired as guards are not from the Baca tribe, and they view the Baca tribe as, like, backwards and lesser, which is ridiculous, but that's kind of the complexities there. Right. And then they physically abuse them, potentially, at least the allegations, um, and, and destroy their houses, and, you know, and this stuff happens. And again, WWF is paying money uh, for these guards. And so, you know, it they're... They, because of their willingness to step into basically any country on earth, they have to work with dictators and tyrants and really bad people sometimes. Sure. Um, and then they also have to work in these really complicated situations. But I think that that should not negate their responsibility uh, when this stuff goes bad. And I would like to see WWF uh, do a lot more to both neutralize this stuff and say, we're not going to stand for it. And we'll walk away if it gets bad. Um you know, we'll, 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 we're willing to wash our hands. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, admit when something goes wrong. I mean, I think one of the, one of the issues I always have with WWF is like, I never see them just say, okay, we fucked up and we're sorry. Right. You know? Right. You know, like, yes, this went wrong and here's why. And look, you know, we're, we're sorry. And here's how we're going to change uh, in this particular situation. So, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just one guy, I'm just a journalist. Um, you know, and I, 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 you know, and I, so, but that's sort of my larger scale view of, of, of kind of what's going on there. And it's a really complicated situation. Yeah. I don't, again, I, I only know as much as I've read in these various articles and as much as I've, I've written about and read in the past, but this is a, this is a systematic uh, issue um, yeah. that is and kind I, of coming to the light. And I think the difficulty is, is, I mean, you, you and I are on the same team. Like we, I look at WWF and the last thing you want to do is demonize the group that is responsible for so many of these really important efforts throughout the world. But mm -hmm. at the same time, when you donate someplace, you want to make sure that they understand all those nuances and take things to the yeah. furthest extreme to see things through. And if you're only bringing the ball 80% of the way to the goal line and then hoping for the best and that last 20%, things are getting pretty screwed up to the fact that you're actually having a detrimental effect to everything you lose the faith that you really need to have those things happen. And I don't well, know. And, and this for, for me on a personal level, I, when I think, and, and this is not the way I was before I was a journalist because I just didn't know, but I've, as a luxury of a journalist is I've learned all this stuff about different organizations. So I, when I look at donating, I really try and find a group that is working on the ground in the region um, and has a very, usually a small to medium sized group and has a very specific goal and, and knows the community that they work in. And I think right. those are often the most nimble and effective groups. Now, the issue with those groups is they can't get some things done like WWF can in the sense of large scale protected areas that might span right. several countries. And policy or and stuff like policy that. Policy and pressuring governments and stuff. And I think WWF, I mean, honestly doesn't go far enough in a lot of policy with like climate change and things. But, um, what I will say is that they have a certain amount of clout that no one else has. But if I'm going to give my money to somebody, I will give it to a small group that I know does really, really good work on the ground and that knows those those communities and those species. And they stretch and I, the dollar a lot further than, yeah, than most people and, do. And, I, and I'm, I'm not concerned about WWF having, uh, you know, WWF gets a lot of money from governments and foundations and, and other places around the world. They're fine. I'm not concerned about them. I'm not concerned about uh, the Nature Conservancy or Conservation International in terms of funding. Like, <laughs> yeah, I would yeah, much rather give good. my money to a to a group that really needs it um, than 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 the larger groups. Yeah, because I go back and forth on. There's that parable, right? That you're you're hanging out on a river, you're sitting by the waterfall, and all of a sudden you see 
a bunch of baskets with a baby in it floating towards the waterfall. And you're sitting there and you're like, oh shit, like I am going to do everything I possibly can to grab all these baskets and put them on the shore, help them find homes, everything like that. But at a certain point in time, it's really also arguably more important to be like, who is dumping these babies and baskets into (laughs) the river? You know what I mean? For me, like I really care about, I agree with you totally. And that's why at the end of every podcast now, I'm asking the folks who are as well versed in this as you and um, these photographers, cinematographers, conservationists, scientists, like who would you donate to if you could? Because I think those people who are at the waterfall doing the grassroots work on the ground who understand these things better than anybody are so, so important. They stretch the dollar further. They understand these things better. But then there's, there's no denying that like you need those people at the source who can really do the political side of things and yeah. really leverage that. Yes. Um, and, and I think both of those are more important than anybody that's operating in the middle because the middle really doesn't matter as much. So yeah. it's, it's, it's just difficult because uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big complicated thing, but yeah. I just think that hopefully you get these policy changes in place that, kind of alleviate a lot of this downstream pressure because there's so much of that. I think that could very quickly, some of these governments could make things a lot easier on people. Anyways, moving on. (laughs) (laughs) So, so you have a a new column. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about um, where people can find it and what the focus of the new column is? Sure. So um, I have, so I I initially had a blog with uh, the guardian for three years Mm -hmm. and um, that was called radical conservation. And that's still all on the guardian. If people are interested in checking that out. And I was really, it was a lot of fun to be able to like have this blog and to be able to kind of figure out what stories I wanted to cover, what was most interesting to me. And, and I was really focused on, you know, as the title says, radical conservation, I was really focused on uh, small groups, uh, individuals who are really trying innovative things and that was really focused on species that I think just didn't get a lot of the attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and then last year, the Guardian uh, made the decision to that they were going to cancel all of their environmental blogs. So a lot of us who had been writing for them for certain for a number of years, you know, kind of were like, "Oh, okay. <laughs> like we kind of got the, the door." <laughs> that sucks. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It was. A, you know, I think a lot of us were both taken aback because, uh, it, you know, we felt like there 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 wasn't a lot of stake. I mean, there wasn't a lot of like. The Guardian didn't have to do a lot. We wrote these blogs. We did a lot of the editing. The Guardian would do some help and stuff, but it wasn't a lot of input from them. Right. Um, and they really just trusted us, which I think was amazing as a journalist to just kind of have that trust. Now, I think The Guardian is, I think, one of the best places for environmental coverage in the world. So mm-hmm. I, I, I really respect them and I still write for them when I can as a freelancer. So, I, uh, you know, and I think they were just making a decision to go in a different direction. And, you know, that's their prerogative to certainly to do that. Sure. Um, But when that happened, I was like, okay, I want to, you know, I want to see if I can keep some kind of blog or column or something going. So I sort of approached a few different media sites and eventually uh, got a really uh, exciting agreement with Manga Bay. And Manga Bay is where I got my start as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So kind of like coming home a little bit. So um, I'm doing this column now for Manga Bay and it's called uh, Saving Life on Earth, Words on the Wild. And it, it's a similar focus. You know, it, I'm trying to look at stories that have either been overlooked by other journalists. Um, I'm trying to look at species that I, I just find really interesting that might not get as much tension. And it's a monthly column. So every month I'll be publishing something. And it's sort of a, a different blend of sometimes it's going to be maybe more of an opinion piece. And sometimes it'll be more sort of like hard scale journalism. Um, so it, it's gonna, the, the genre might kind of differ, but, uh, Manga Bay has been wonderful about giving me again, some of that freedom as a journalist to be able to kind of take on some stories and, and I'm working with some editors there on finding, yeah, the best stories I can and hopefully bringing some attention to things that don't usually get attention. That's super cool. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. It's really exciting. It's, and it's, we've, I've had three articles go up since January, February, March. So um, and it's been a lot of, uh, and I've been really happy with them and, and some of them, you know, they've been seemed to have a good reception so far. So the, there was the bottleneck climate change article. There was yeah. the generation climate article. What was the third one? Uh, the, the tapir, the potential. Oh, the, oh yeah. that, that was on the tapir one was on this. I didn't know that was part of this new column. Yeah, it is. Yep. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So that was the first one in January was this, this, this idea that I stumbled across that some researchers had been talking about bringing the tapir back to Borneo. So the tapir, um, 
is 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 not in Borneo anymore, but the Malayan tapir, which is that tapir that's black and white and so distinct looking. So cool. Um, yeah, it's such an amazing animal. I I have a lot of love for tapirs, um, and it's the only tapir in all of Asia. Um, but they used to be in Borneo. There are uh, amazing cave paintings that have just been discovered in the last few years that are forty thousand years old, I think, um, and they have a picture of a tapir on it. And then uh, a couple of different archaeologists have discovered tapir bone um, within uh, human, you know, uh, human caves. So the humans would have been hunting the tapir, you know, eating it, and then would have brought the bones back into the caves. So crazy. So, yeah, and and we so we know tapirs were there until at least about a thousand, two thousand years ago. And there's potential that the tapir could have survived even into the 20th century. There's a lot of sightings claimed of tapir. Uh, into the 1930s, but um, there was no no one ever got like a body, no one ever shot an animal or you know. But there was people that claimed. I think I think one of the last claims was like at a golf course, someone said they saw a tapir <laughs> in Borneo. So you know, and the thing is, is like you know, you can look at those sightings and be like, oh, that's just BS. You know, the tapir wasn't there. But like, if you know anything about tapir, like, there's no other animal you would mistake that with. Yeah, you know, it's really hard. Like maybe a warthog of some kind, maybe a boar, but like, like a they're cow they're elephant. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're so you know, black and white, long, gangly nose. So if you got it, if, if the person who claims they saw this, and some of these people were naturalists, you know, um, and other people were indigenous people that said that they, you know, had saw them. Um, and those people, naturalists and indigenous people, are the people that you would trust the most sure. to know the difference between a tapir and a and a wild pig. Um, so. So, also, yeah, like so, anybody that's not a naturalist or a, a, an indigenous person, if they saw something, they would most likely think it's a pig, not think it's a tapir, yeah, you, you like, know what like, I mean? Clearly a Malayan tapir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like some dude who's just a golfer is like, oh, <laughs> the Malayan tapir, of course. Exactly. Now let's go get our gin and ice. Um, <laughs> So uh, these, this, uh, there's, a, there's a man uh, who's the Earl of Crambrook, Crambrook. And he lives in the UK, but he's a big naturalist and with a lot of ties to Malaysia. And he basically proposed this idea of why don't we bring tapir back to Borneo? And I was just very interested in this. I mean, the idea of rewilding has become very popular, mm -hmm. but it's become very popular mostly so far in the West. And so I just kind of thought, well, this is interesting. So I spoke with him and, um, you know, I had a really hard time for a while trying to find researchers and government officials who wanted to touch this because I think there's for, for a number of good reasons, there's a lot of like hesitancy to even talk about it. Um, you don't want to get people excited. You don't want people to think it's actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you also, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, there's a lot of practical, rational reasons not to do this. Um, which I kind of outlined in the article because I finally did get a, a, a tapir researcher who works in Malaysia to, you know, on the record, he was willing to say like, no, we should not do this. This is just not really worth it. You know, it's not a great idea. Um, but so the, so the story is a little bit about that tension between sort of the practical reasonable side of like, you know, there's these, there's good reasons, money, um, the fact that tapirs are endangered elsewhere. Maybe we should put the focus on that. Mm -hmm. Just, all, um, the, the, the cost and time and effort. Those are the good kind of rational reasons why this is sort of maybe a silly idea to put our resources in. On the other hand, <laughs> there's I think there's a certain just uh, the idea uh, in Southeast Asia where we're losing so many things, where the forest destruction is so bad, where the wiping out of species is so bad. It's just to me, I was I was enticed by the idea of an optimistic, positive story. Um, that wasn't about extinction. That was about bringing back an animal that was once wiped out and, and, and clearly had been wiped out, at least probably in part by human hunting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, certainly habitat change and climate change probably played a role um, and maybe decreased the areas where ha tapirs could live in Borneo. But humans certainly were hunting it. And for whatever reasons, it, it, it vanished, you know, uh, and but certainly hunting pressure was a part of that. Um, and so I, the, the idea of doing something positive and optimistic and something that could garner some really good, like just some good press for tapirs, um, and for Southeast Asia conservation felt really enticing to me. Maybe, maybe I let my heart get, get away yeah. from me, and, you know, didn't listen enough to my head, but I really tried to present both those arguments. But in the end, I was kind of like, you know, 
this is just really uh, an interesting idea. And uh, I, I sort of look back a lot on, and I mentioned this in the article, you know, in the 1990s when we brought wolves back to Yellowstone National Park mm-hmm. and just how much it changed the ecosystem in Yellowstone. And now we have wolf populations bouncing back all over the lower 48. Yeah, which is badass. Um, badass and it's wonderful and i you know and and we couldn't have guessed in the 1990s that that would have been the the outcome that we would have gotten all this amazing science from the wolves coming back that we would have had these populations bouncing back that would you you know you you have wolves just going into iowa and california and you know they're they're making their way and it's a wonderful conservation story and so and i don't want to draw a direct parallel because obviously it tapers a different species it would have different challenges a different thing but like the idea of maybe building up a, a, a positive story like that for a place like Southeast Asia. And then the other thing is that there is already a facility in Sabah and Tabin National Park that is currently houses two Sumatran rhinos um, and that would have space for tapirs. So you could potentially go to um, mainland Malaysia, peninsular Malaysia. You could get some tapirs that are now in rescue facilities or in zoos, and you could bring them to this place in Tabin. You could do some captive breeding, which we know how to do with tapirs, mm-hmm. and you can potentially start to re-release their um, offspring into the wild and just, again, very closely kind of monitor and see what happens. But it could potentially bring some, just some really interesting efforts and, and, and science into the, into Tabin. Um, you know, so I think there's a really good debate to be have, and I understand a lot of the criticism of this idea that it's sort of, why, why would we spend our money on this? Why would we spend our effort on it? But I guess in the end, my heart kind of beat my head and I was excited about it. Yeah, well, I think there's there's something inherently valuable about optimism like you were pointing to that I don't think is like a foofy, feel-good kind of thing. I think it's very real in the sense that people are beaten over the head with how bad things are and how messed up things are being, especially animals that are targeted in the wildlife trade and have really high values. And people don't hear about like the really amazing stories that are going on like the wolves like the grizzly bears who have been doing a lot better like um the lord house stick insect like yeah. the, the california condor where there was 15 left in the world and now yeah. there's hundreds of them down in southern california and i think something particularly in southeast asia uh where you hear stories like i had with bill roby show where yeah. he was explaining that Yes, there's hundreds of thousands of wire snare traps in these rainforests, but when the poachers came upon a sow law, they let it go and they told the right authorities, like, hey, you need to go check this out and see if there's any way you can help it. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did is because they had an inherent understanding that these are valuable. They're found nowhere else in the world. And oh, by the way, like there's really not much economic value behind them. And when Mm -hmm. you look at something like a Malayan tapir, that's something where, yes, you could kill it for its meat. But I think if it's a story you could bring to Southeast Asia, that's possible. It doesn't have like an intense value associated to it from anything that you can pull from it. But you might be able to get local peoples to have a sense of pride as to this unique animal. It, that can proliferate into other species as well. Exactly, yeah. And I think we often look at, and, and I understand why, because there is so much scarcity in conservation. Conservation is fully the underfunded. But I think sometimes we forget that like, sometimes funding the right project or doing something new and exciting can produce a ripple effect. And you might not have, never even know what that ripple effect was, but maybe you know you can... Uh, inspire some young children in Saba who then grow up and decide to be conservationists and decide to, you know, you just don't know. Um, 100%. And so, yeah. So I just, I think that there is that, and I, and I'm not going to, you know, I mean, I, in the article, I do kind of advocate in the end being like, let's, you know, why not give it a try and consider it, you know, but, but I think, you know, I mean, this is a decision that needs to be made by Malaysia and it needs to be made by Saba and anyone else who would be involved. Like, I'm not saying I have the right to make this decision in any way at all. But yeah. I do think that sometimes we forget that, you know, those kind of optimistic stories or potentially happy stories or innovative stories can really capture people's imaginations and can maybe then have these ripple effects that can that can start to move things in a different direction. In, now, in whether ter- or not, yeah, sorry. sorry. No, I was going to say in terms of the tapir itself, there's three or four species. I think it's four. Um, 
in my understanding, I might be wrong though, the Malayan tapir specifically is the only one of those three or four that's it's endangered, but it's not like on the brink by any stretch. No, of well, it's 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 pretty it's pretty it's not on the brink. It's it's oh, between it I think I think maybe like thousand and fifteen hundred. Oh, so, so that's, it's that's not, not a lot. It's not doing it's not doing great. Um, and one of the big issues with the Malayan tapir is like right now it's like uh, it just gets hit on the roads a lot. <laughs> Honestly, uh, like uh, roadkill. That's um, awful. Yeah, and it used to be, uh, it's only now in Sumatra, I believe, and peninsular Malaysia, and it used to, be, you know, have a wider range. Um, so uh, let's let's assume best case scenario you did this and you were able to establish a new population on Borneo, and let's assume that you were able to, like, move it into new places. Like, potentially, yes, that could help the species in the long term of survival, right? Um, but I think we have to also be honest, like, if we did this, the original probably goal would not necessarily be like, well, we're going to save the species from extinction by moving, you know, a few individuals into Borneo and, and establishing like a population of maybe 30 animals or 40 animals. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, if you, if you look at it long-term, kind of like with wolves, you know, it, uh, you could then see that tapir could, could benefit as a species from this. Um, because they are, I mean, they're peninsula Malaysia and Sumatra, are you know very very threatened lots of forest loss lots of mm -hmm. roadkill lots of hunting um so it's not like the tapir is uh out of the woods we do have it in captivity though so i mean we're not going to lose it entirely anytime soon it's certainly doing better than a lot of other animals that could use more attention in southeast asia um so and that's another argument for maybe this is a sort of a a, a silly thing to do um but uh, again, it just sort of captured my imagination in a way that I thought, well, let's, I want to write about it because I hadn't seen anyone really done like a big exploration of what would this even look like. Yeah. And I also don't think it's silly either. I think uh, we tend to view those things. It's like I, I, I'm on this new path where I, I'm talking about it way too much. But the whole like arbitrary decision making as to like what we view as society is important. Like the all this like development in the industrial revolution and the technological revolution and like going to Mars and all these things where it's like, yes, we're programmed as humans to like want to progress and want to move forward in whatever we deem is important. But ultimately, like nobody knows why we're on earth. Nobody knows what's going on. I mean, yeah, right, like right, we all yeah. have our ideas, but it's like, why is it more important to go to Mars than to reintroduce it to Pier into Borneo? I don't know. Like, it all sounds pretty cool to me. Yeah. And, and, if we and are, honestly, it would be so much cheaper to, to re-release Malayan tapirs into Borneo than it would be to go to Mars. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's, there's all this discussion about like Mars and other planets. And I think that, again, it, it, it excites people's imagination and certainly does me, mine. But the idea that like that some people keep saying that I hear sometimes within uh, certain communities of like, we got to go to Mars so we can build a planet because we're killing the one we have. And it's like, that's insane. It's like, literally insane. It's you, all you go outside in Mars and you just die. Like, <laughs> we're not going to we're not going to terraform a freaking planet um, to but, make it look like Earth within the time frame that we would then. Why not just save the planet we're on? Because, you know, why not yeah. just protect what we have? <laughs> because it's too expensive, Jeremy. Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> right. But like going to freaking <laughs> Earth, I mean, it apparently is like. So I, I think we get, you know, I think we get, I think we get seduced by this science fiction idea. And I'm not saying we. I, I'm totally for space travel. Um, I'm totally for space exploration. Same. But the idea that that's going to lead to sa the saving of the human race when we can't even save the freaking planet we already have, that's like, we've literally adapted. That's like to perfect us. for us. Yeah. yeah. It's perfect for us. And it's beautiful. Like, why not go outside and like, look at a flower? Like, it, you know? <laughs> they also say like, if you want to know what it's like to live on Mars, like once we actually make it inhabitable, you mm -hmm. can go to Antarctica and imagine it being 10 times worse. <laughs> and then yeah, that's, that's what it's going to be like for you to be on Mars. If, if the goal is to save the human species, and I'm not even sure that that is, is always how we should look at the world. Like I'm all for the human species and I, I love the human I'm, species. I'm pro human for sure. Yeah. But if, if that's sort of like the end goal, like the, the much better investment is to like invest on the planet we already have. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. And touched on. So, yeah, anyway, and, and like the that, tapir, to me, I look at something and it's like, it's been successfully captively bred. It's range. My guess is it's not too, too far. So you can kind of keep an eye on the things. There's not a huge economic value to them. And ultimately, if we are up against like a big climate threat, which we are, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not questioning that you got to sure. stack the deck in terms of biodiversity as much as we can. And 
the more that we can spend into stacking the deck, I think is important. And and then that just also goes to sort of stacking the deck in terms of like producing stories that people can relate to, you know, producing, producing outcomes that are exciting and interesting, different. And I'm not saying that's all conservationists should do that. I mean, that would be terrible Mm -hmm. if we all just try to do these sexy stories, but like, you know, we can try and do some of them to try and, and build a, a more optimistic, a more exciting movement and get yeah. more people interested on, in Earth than in Mars, you know? Because um, there's, so reason, there's reasonable efforts, right? Like something like introducing a tapir into Borneo, that seems reasonable to me. But then you, <laughs> then you hear these crazy stories of, have you heard this new theory that a big way to fight climate change would be to clone and create like the woolly mammoth and release them up into the Arctic. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like now that to me, that doesn't seem super reasonable. I don't know. Yeah. Although there, I'm sure they'll try and, yeah. and to, you know, and maybe again, this is just, I'm being seduced by the idea, but would I want to see a woolly mammoth? Hell yeah. Yeah. You know, oh, it'd be amazing. And, you know, um, the thing is about woolly mammoths is too, is like we are responsible for the woolly mammoths demise. Like I, I really think if humans had never evolved, Woolly mammoths would still be here. That's my guess. Yeah. Um, maybe not the same population or range, but you know, and I'm not saying again that we should invest a bunch of money and interest and, and stuff, but like if someone wants to try to do that, I I I'm not like wholly against it. But the idea that that's going to somehow call it solve climate change is a I think that's a red herring. Well, that, think, that's like think, that's how you sexify it so that somebody yeah. funds the project is exactly yeah. what it is. I, I think it's a little more important to just shut down coal plants and stop drilling for oil. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> that would go a little further what is and the, like what is the thought that they have there that somehow it it like breaks up the arctic tundra to help with the methane yeah, or something like, like that it would, it would potentially the idea is that it would change the arctic tundra because elephants are these ecosystem engineers and they're massive and you know all long lifespans and that it would change the arctic uh tundra to i i don't know exactly but to to change uh it enough that it would it would store more carbon than it does now and and I don't know. Like the the other thing is like that is so many hundred, like decades off. Like you first have to create one. You'd have to raise it. Then you'd have to create more. <laughs> then you'd have to work for thirty years for it to be. You know. And then like the thing is that the, that I think the the biggest question for me about this kind of bringing back woolly mammoths or bringing back any species is is but especially with elephants. Like these are animals that are more socially community community oriented than freaking humans are. Right. How do you you start with a few of them and then turn them into a real family unit. I oh, don't know. That's, if that's interesting. Possible. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, elephants learn everything from their mothers, you know, and if you don't have a mother, are you going to have humans dressing as elephants and with pheromones on them running around the, the tundra <laughs> trying to like... teach them how to survive when we don't even know how they did it in the first place. So I, I don't know. I think that's it's like trying it's to certain... answer the answer of what came first, the chicken or the egg. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like oh, we can, so, I mean, I'm, I, again, like I, I'm totally, you know, I mean, I, and again, maybe it's just the sexiness and maybe I watch too many Jurassic Park movies, but um, I'm, I'm open to the sense of woolly mammoths. I'm not open to dinosaurs. I'll put it that way, though. Um, and I'm oh, open to the pterodactyl would be dope. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> it's like, the reason I would be wo- open to woolly mammoths is because we, we push them to extinction. Yeah, and it's, it's like bison. It's like if bison had finally, which they almost did, cross over to extinction, like, that's an incredibly cool success story. That's a huge success story. And then you have the the European bison, which was down to 12 individuals, and now there's hundreds. Oh, I didn't um, know that. That's cool. Yeah. That's one of the most amazing stories, too. Um, so, you know, be, if, if humans were involved, like, uh, and then we are able to somehow do this, I'm, I'm open to it. I'm, I'm, but I think we should be clear-eyed about the challenges and clear-eyed about, like, this is not going to, like, right. in the time frame. Like, that's not going to solve climate change. That's, no, that's I also crazy. heard, too, like, it's, it's also kind of fictional in the sense that, like, you can't create a woolly mammoth again. So the yeah. concept is that they would take the genes that they found in the woolly mammoth DNA, because you can still find tusks all over the place, like frozen mm-hmm. up in the Arctic, and replace the gene sequence in an African elephant to match the DNA of what the woolly mammoth was like. But you can't change everything. So essentially what you'd be having is these incredibly hairy, overgrown yeah. genes actually, in it, the elephant community. And it would actually be the Asian elephant. The oh, Asian. Asian. Elephant, yeah, the more more closely related to the... to the and, the and I think what they would think... That, I mean, at least one of the ideas I've heard is that they would actually have... You know, the, they would be born from Asian elephant mothers. But again, Asian elephants, you know, that's a really good proxy. But, you know, Asian elephants can't live in Russia. So, yeah. you know... <laughs> yeah. 
how are you going to then do that? How are you going to have that animal have the social rearing that it needs? Also, the, there's no denying, like, if you're an Asian elephant mother, you've had eight kids, and all of a sudden you birth out this hair, <laughs> hairy new this, being. It might be a little freaky. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, and yeah. So let's, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But let's also not be ridiculous about what these these are scientific experiments in the in a sort of a Frankensteinish manner that I think come with moral questions that we have to be really serious about. But also, let's not be ridiculous about like this isn't going to solve climate change. This isn't going to like overturn other disasters. Like, yes, it's an interesting idea. I'm certainly open to like considering it. But like, let's not turn it into something that it's not. Yeah. Like, where do you stand on something like? Uh, to me, this is like kind of in the same vein, but a little bit more applicable, like something like Sudan, who is just the last male northern white rhino that passed away. A lot of what they're talking about is doing some like in vitro stuff with the existing females that still have eggs to potentially save yeah. that species. Like to me, that's you're you're still keeping it, it's artificial in the sense of how the birthing is or the uh, the yeah, basically the whole pregnancy process but it's still authentic DNA. It's still the same animal. So there's, there's and, some, a little bit more validity there to me. Yeah. And so essentially it would be like, a, I think a Southern white rhino mother giving birth to a Northern white rhino. Right. And um, there's still some, I think some debate about whether the Northern white rhinos are a distinct subspecies, which is what they're considered as, or actually. Oh, interesting. Species. I didn't know that. Yeah. There's some, there's some debate about whether subspecies are species, but in some ways it, it's, it's, it's a little bit moot. I mean, I'm totally in favor. I say, you know, do whatever you freaking can do. And do what you can do in that, like, you give future generations the potential to do, to go further if they have better technology or they have more funding or whatever. Like, save all the sperm we can save. Do what you can do. Um, and and because conservation is such a long odds game. Yeah. That if you think back to, like, like, the American bison or the European bison, the fact that we were able to save even a few individuals uh, made all the difference to today. And now we have you know, thousands of American bison, hundreds of European bison, uh, fulfilling this niche that had been basically lost and, and coming back. And it's such an exciting story. So like, let's do what we can do. And if, if we never, and this is actually goes to a really interesting thing with climate change too, but if, if we never see it, you know, that's fine, but at least we'll have given our kids an option. For sure. And I think what's dope about all this stuff too, and bringing it back to kind of like Bill Roby's show is like, these are the types of things that literally takes one person to a yeah. small cohort of people to be like, I'm not going to let this happen. Yeah. And making it happen. Like that, that's not, that's not a dream. That's not like a, a fantasy. It's like very true that it's going to take one person who's like, I'm not going to let the Northern white rhino go extinct. I'm going to get this yeah. in vitro thing going, or I'm going to help the Sao La, or I'm going to take care of the Sumatran rhino. And, like, I mean, even when you look at the captive breeding of the Sumatran rhino, I'm sure it was a team, but it's really like started by this one vet who decided like, this is what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And, and it's, there's so many interesting species that have been literally saved by like one individual or one small organization doing the hard work and, and basically putting their, you know, lives into this one thing. And that species is now around because of that one person or that one organization making that decision. And, you know, I think that that, you know, is so inspiring. Um, and that's one reason why it's so much fun to kind of cover conservation is you can, and then you can see, you know, that person never got to see that animal recover. They got to see it maybe, you know, they got to see it survive, but to recover. And that's where we're starting to see in certain places. And this goes to the, the bottleneck um, article that I recently wrote too, that like there are places in the world where we're starting to see, and this is mostly in places like the U.S. and Europe right now, but where you're starting to see some animal populations start to recover. Oh, that's interesting. Can you, well, while, while we're talking about it a bit, can you provide kind of a summary of what that bottleneck article was about sure. and kind of the, so, the concept there? Yeah. So I, I, I stumbled on this research paper by these three scientists from the Wildlife Conservation Society, where they basically argue um, that, uh, it, that the world, ecologically speaking, is in this bottleneck right now, right? where everything is tight, right? We have a, a population of 7.5 billion people. We have, you know, this massive capitalistic economy that's sort of destroying nature willy-nilly to continue to feed itself. Um, we have uh, 
uh, you know, uh, widespread poverty in certain places, though that's changing. And what their argument was, was as basically as uh, economies kind of go from developing, right, uh, to sort of advanced economies. So we're talking about places like, kind of like starting to go into like Japan, uh, you could maybe argue the U.S., uh, for sure, uh, and, and parts of Europe, when they go into this, they go through this bottleneck, basically, right, where the population is really big, where consumption is really high, and the, and everything in nature shrinks. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a point where the country becomes wealthy enough that there's very little poverty, uh, where uh, uh, cities become sort of the dominant force, where more and more people are moving out of the countryside into cities. And this is these are things that we see all around the world, right? This is a macro level things mm -hmm. um and, uh where the population starts the 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 basically where women start having fewer babies the fertility rate declines um and the reason that fertility rate declines is women are getting educated um there's good health care there's uh preventative care so this means that basically uh when families you know uh, throughout most of human history people had lots of babies to hedge their bets you'd have seven kids because you know probably two to three would never make it to adulthood, uh, you know, yeah. um, you know, you, yeah. most of them would die, you know, by the age of two or three. Um, there's a lot of cultures even today where you won't name a child until they hit a certain age because uh, that's dark. Yeah, it is. But that's, that's most of human history, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, you know, young children often didn't survive childhood diseases, accidents, all sorts of things, you know, but mostly it was disease, you know, you, the children would die of malaria or, um, you know, all these things we have vaccines for now, you mm -hmm. know, kids used to die. Um, so, but you get to a point basically where, you know, women are going to work, uh, they're educated, uh, men are educated, there's less poverty and people are deciding to have fewer children. And this is happening all over the world. And then you start to see amazingly in some places like Japan and Portugal, um, in places like that, where like literally the population starts to shrink, you know, it peaks and it starts to shrink. Um, so what they're what 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 the bottleneck to breakthrough theory is sort of looking at is like they say that this happens in different countries and what they're they're theorizing is that this will happen in all over the world in the next you know hundred years or so that all over the world we're going to see this uh, less poverty driving a uh, drive of the population to the cities where sort of energy efficiency and and sort of efficiency of of capital in some ways is like you know heightened um, and at the same time the population could drop. Uh, well, wh what they would say is, you know, that, that that's what we should be, you know, focused on is the population will, you know, people will have fewer and fewer babies until, mm -hmm. you know, they'll spend more money on education and things until basically people are deciding, I only have, I only can afford to have one kid or I only want two kids, you know, and you're not worried about losing any of those kids because it's so rare. Um, and so what that could do is, and this is a long, what, what was so interesting about this theory is to me is it really made me think in a in time period that was so long scale. We're talking about 100, 200 years mm -hmm. where all of a sudden the human population could be maybe 60, 70 percent living in cities. Um, it would maybe be, you know, we have 7.5 billion today. There's one projection, uh, very extreme projection, but it is a projection that we could maybe be down to 2.5 billion uh, by 2300. So in less than like in over 250 years, less than 300 years, we could be at you know a third of the human population we have today. Does, that, what does that, that seem realistic to you? Um, it seems possible. I'm not going to say it's realistic. There, there are basically trying to predict population. It's so difficult because what's happened in the world is, is this, this demographic change has happened everywhere except for sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. um, people are having fewer and fewer babies except for sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason why it hasn't happened in sub-Saharan Africa is complex, but it's, you know, it, it's uh, largely due to poverty, uh, rural People tend to have more children because they're they're working on farms and they want kids that can help them do the work. Um, and also, there's just less access to birth control, to women's education, to all those kind of things. Sure. They're 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 still booming with the population. So whether or not that can happen, I don't know. I don't think it's impossible though. I really don't think it's impossible. When you look at the numbers, it's crazy how quickly a population. If you look at some place like Brazil, how quickly the the number of uh, babies a family is having can just drop. And even in the US, you know, we're having fewer babies right now in the US than we will than will replace us. Mm -hmm. You know, couple to couple. Our demographic fertility has dropped below replacement levels. Now we're not going to see our population fall because there's a certain momentum built into population that we have to wait 
80 years for generations to kind of die off for that to like see it. And also the U.S. has still high immigration levels, right? Right, right. So we have immigrants coming in that are buffeting our population, but people are having fewer and fewer kids in the U.S. Um, and that's happened, and that's you know happened in Europe. That's happening everywhere except for Sub-Saharan Africa. So I don't think it's impossible. Um, what happens though is when it starts to happen, you know, everyone freaks out, right? Politicians and economic it, economists go crazy because they're like, oh my god. You know, we're, me, women need to have babies. And, you know, the, a number of Japanese politicians have gotten themselves in trouble for calling women baby-making machines. Um, yeah. For say, Yeah, for saying really stupid, offensive things. Um, but what I think we should be doing as a society is we should be embracing this and saying, this needs to happen. Yes, will it create challenges? Will it create economic challenges? Yeah, but this needs to happen because it gives us a chance to um, save global biodiversity. And it gives us a chance uh, to really get through the bottleneck and what they call breakthrough, which is basically like, you know, where you start to see wildlife populations come back. Um, and you see that in places like Europe, in the U.S., um, in, in, again, in specific circumstances. I'm not going to say that everything's coming back. That's ridiculous. That hasn't happened anywhere. Or that there isn't massive ecological problems, especially with things right now, like the, the, the idea of the, the insect Armageddon that's going on is very, very concerning. Yeah. Um, and none of this, none of this, you know, the, the thing that I think the, the, the wrench that could, that could throw us all into turmoil is going to be climate change. Um, unless we get a handle on climate change, like the idea that we could somehow break through someday is, 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 is increasingly to me doubtful, but it was really, it was a really fun exercise and to, to think about this. And I got to talk to two of the scientists who came up with this bottleneck to breakthrough and it was such a wonderful conversation. And these two guys are just whip smart. Like they're just yeah. like throwing stats and, you know, and they know all this stuff and they're, they're really, really interesting. Um, and I think, you know, uh, again, I was a little, I mean, I was, I let myself be a little seduced by the idea um, for a little while. And I think it's a very, it's a very interesting idea. And I think people should, should take it seriously um, because if we take it seriously, then we can actually maybe act to make it happen. So the concept just in summary is, if yeah, all sorry, of a sudden, long, no, 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 it, it, yeah. it, it's helpful to provide the color. But I think in general, you have poverty lessening in the world. You have yeah. education going up. And a lot of times the byproduct of that is having less children. Yeah. And at the same time, and, and that's just like a statistical thing. Um, yeah. And at the same time, cities are growing up. We're, we're becoming yeah. more urbanized. We're becoming a lot more energy efficient within those cities. So even if the population doesn't necessarily decline, it, it stabilizes if you're consolidating all of that into the cities, which seems to be a trend that these wild areas will likely start to grow up again and there's less yeah. economic pressure on killing all of our species. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I think the, the one of the, one of the, you know, I think, I think there's, there's going to be people that are very critical of this idea and that's fine. I think we should be uh, skeptical. Of, of any of these kinds of ideas. But I think one of the ways to criticize it or one of the, one of the points that I think is most challenging is the idea of consumption. Mm -hmm. So because the population decline is going to take so long, you know, uh, people in wealthier countries often consume more than people in developing countries. Right. Um, now eventually that stabilizes, right? Like eventually, you know, but we're still going to be consuming too much for too long that I still think we have to kind of D and think about how we're going to deal with this, uh, consumption. And one of the things they talk a lot about uh, with me was the, sort of the idea of decoupling, you know, that like our consumption over time will decouple from carbon emissions, will decouple from maybe direct na uh, destruction of nature um, yeah. because the population will start to stabilize, because we'll, we'll create societies that are sort of more efficient. Um, now, uh, you can argue whether or not that's going to happen. You know, are humans going to be wise enough to actually achieve those things? I don't know. But that's kind of their argument is that our economy is going to change. And it might not be an economy that's going to, it's not going to be an economy that's going to be growing maybe at the rates that we're used to. And that's going to be a very interesting challenge. Yeah. It, it comes back to the, to the same thing we were talking about earlier, which is this arbitrary uh, thing that we've deemed it's progress. And I think yes. there, there's, there's going to have to be a new baseline that governments base their success off of outside of GDP. Like everybody, yeah. all people care about top line is GDP. How much more are we making? How much more are we buying? How much more are we doing? 
Whereas ultimately, if you start making a benchmark as the happiness of the population or the success of the planet, like restabilizing and yeah. things like that, which I don't think that's like a utopian thing. I think that's like no. we are using the wrong benchmark to base these yeah. things off of. And to it, your, your decoupling point, like I think the... <sighs> I think at the end of the day, no matter how economically this might be sound somewhat pessimistic, but uh, I like to think of myself as an <clears throat> optimistic person, but acting in realism, <clears throat> I think no matter if, if culture stays the same and if stigma stays the same, no matter how rich and no matter how wealthy a population gets, if it's still okay to be using rhino horn, to be having ivory in your house, that price will get higher and higher as there's less and less of those animals and that will still be a thing. I don't yeah. think that, I think oh, yeah. to me, sure. all that matters is changing the culture and the stigma around all of this. And that's why well, groups like Wild Aid who are helping use like pop culture icons like Yao Ming to help with that is so important because it, it's it's truly, to stop the wildlife trade, it's strictly going to be a culture shift and a policy shift in, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think that's totally true. And and I think, you know, like Wild Aid has one of the best ideas that you have to do a cultural shift. and. Um, you know, but I think that we should also not be pessimistic about that. Like we we saw the cultural shift around the fur trade, right? We're not going out there and shooting jaguars anymore for their furs. Oh, I'm not just, pessimistic about the culture. Just just to clarify, sorry yeah. not to cut you off. I'm not pessimistic no, no. about that. I'm pessimistic about saying like if everybody's wealthy that they would stop hunting tigers. I think. Oh yeah. I, I'm yeah. optimistic in general that. I mean, you run one Yao Ming commercial and shark fin soup drops off 85 percent in a year. Like that's incredible and i think that that's uh i mean it's it's something that i'm incredibly optimistic about if you use media and you use content to start shifting the culture i think that's something that is incredibly possible and also very quickly possible um or rapidly possible i was pessimistic as to the idea that if that culture doesn't change that it's the economics that are really driving that you know yeah for sure and i think you know even with this idea it's not like we're not going to lose stuff you know uh, we put ourselves on a course that we are going to lose stuff. We are, if, if we're in a bottleneck now, part of the idea of the bottleneck is things get, things get squished, things get pressure, and that not everything's going to make it through the bottleneck. But the question is, how? What can we do today? What can we do now as human beings to give nature the best chance to survive and recover? Um, you know, to to give humans the best chance maybe is a better way to put it mm -hmm. to survive and 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 have a life that isn't you know, a, a 20th century Fox post-apocalyptic movie, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I think what's and, interesting about it is like, uh, I had two visceral reactions to the article. Mm -hmm. One was kind of, okay, like, it's nice to have an optimistic look on outlook on climate change and biodiversity and the fact that we might be at the worst stage that this is all at, but as these yeah. factors t take their natural course, that things will get better. And I think that that's uh, a very interesting concept. I I, I kind of go back and forth with how I feel about like if it's true sure. or not. But I think what I didn't love about it is like, I almost think that at the end of the day, climate change is a very real thing that we need to be addressing. And anything that makes people feel comfortable doing what they're doing is not very helpful. But sure. at the same time, you and I talked on our first conversation about how apathetic people become to talking about climate change in general. And if you twist that conversation to saying, hey, we have something to be optimistic about in terms of biodiversity and climate change, but this theory could play out, but it's completely dependent upon these factors actually playing out. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you start making climate change a little bit more actionable and a little bit less depressing. And that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I think it's it's really complicated because I mean it's the the I don't want to put words into the researcher's mouth, but I think they don't see it so much as optimistic. They see it as like a roadmap for what we need to do today. Um, they see it as something that's not passive but actionable that needs to oh, be okay. taken action on. Um, and you know, this has nothing in some ways. Bottleneck to breakthrough really doesn't have much to do with climate change because climate change is already built into the system and it needs to be dealt with on a time scale much shorter than bottleneck to breakthrough, right? Bottleneck to Breakthrough really is about biodiversity. Um, oh, least, okay. Again, so I, mis is, I misinterpreted that a little bit. <clears throat> no, but it, it, it's it's you, it, it's so complicated and it's such a, you know, that I think uh, it's not so much, it, it's it's difficult to kind of wrap your mind around. 
But I think what they would, I mean, again, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I guess what I would say is climate change we have to deal with. If we don't deal with climate change, bottleneck of breakthrough isn't going to really happen in the same way because we'll have lost so much of the species, right? Climate change will wipe them out. Mm -hmm. um, and it will probably turn us into, I don't know, like, <laughs> if we survive climate change, we'll be living in a very different, very dark, or very more unstable world than, than, um, than we are now. Uh, but let's say we deal with climate change effectively in the next uh, 50 years, uh, 100 years, whatever. You know, Let's say we actually finally get ourselves on that task. Then what Bottleneck to Breakthrough kind of says is we can, um, you know, through these different pressure points, right, through uh, population ending poverty, which is a great thing in itself, uh, through urbanization, uh, we can basically start to, 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 to make the world a much more livable place and a much more stable place in terms of biodiversity and, and human welfare. And so like what they would say is like one of the most, and I think I would agree with this, is one of the most important jobs anyone could have today is to go work in urban Africa and, and, and work in making urban African cities better, mm -hmm. uh, work in making uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, have uh, fewer babies dying, <laughs> uh, work in, in, in that kind of area, or working in areas in Southeast Asia that still kind of are really, really on the height of development. Um, places like Indonesia, I think, where if you go to Indonesia, you're, I mean, you're just, it, it's very hard. It's very depressing because everything is on fire. The palm oil plantations are spreading everywhere. You know, the population is booming. You know, it's very hard to see any hope. But so if you're on the ground working there for conservation or for human welfare, those are like the most important places to be working in the world right now um, yeah. to sort of get us through that bottleneck. But none of this, and I want to be very clear, at least from my standpoint, none of this deals with climate change. The population, our global population is not going to go down quick enough uh, to, to, to deal with climate change. Um, we have we you know we should have been dealing with climate change 30 years we, we're we're already 30 years late so uh, to me the climate change is sort of a very separate issue um, but it does I think present some interesting pressure points for conservationists for people who are concerned about human welfare for for people who are working in these fields to think about like maybe you know the different pressure points and this is like there's a group called and I think maybe you've heard of this but Health and Harmony that works in Indonesia. And they work on saving forests through giving people really good access to healthcare. Yeah, it's it's an amazing story. Basically, yeah, saying like, okay, there's been a bunch of illegal like charcoal logging going on in these communities. I want to understand on a grassroots level why that's happening. Oh well, okay, it's because if somebody breaks their arm, they're in danger of dying because there's zero access to healthcare there. And basically, they went in there and made a deal with the community and said, hey, listen, we're going to provide completely free health care to you. But mm -hmm. as a contingency, if one tree goes down, we're pulling out. Yeah. And it's been incredibly successful as far and as I've you, understood. And, and I, what I don't understand is why are we not replicating that? You know, why aren't there I know. You know, different places? Like, why aren't we seeing more of that? And so I think those are the kind of pressure points where you can work with communities to better their lives and at the same time see that, in doing so, we can preserve more nature um, and, and kind of keeping this idea of we can, you know, then hopefully, and a lot of this to me is about, and this is about climate change too, is it's not so much like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 39, um, I'm about halfway through my life. Um, you know, it's about trying to leave as much behind that our kids can then make those decisions with, because we're not gonna be making the decisions in the end. Our children are the ones that are gonna be in the front lines of climate change. Our children are gonna be the ones that are in the front line of mass extinction. Um, and, and so it's basically like, what can we do now to give our children the, the most options on the table that they can then take to, to, to build a better world? Um, and so that's why I'm like, you know, you know, like I'm kind of, this kind of goes in a funny way back to the woolly mammoth, right? Like, why not give our kids options? Why not give our kids options when it comes to the Northern white rhino protect that, you know, DNA, save it. Who knows what it could be done with, you know, in the future. I, why not give, give our kids options when it comes to climate change? You know, I love, and, and I love I, exactly what you're saying. I'm just a little bit more selfish. I want to see the, I want to see the woolly mammoth and, <laughs> and I, I want to see more sure. orangutans because the forests aren't getting chopped down. Oh yeah. Yeah. But all of that is also giving <laughs> options, right? Like you, you supporting orangutans surviving today means our kids will have more orangutans 
to to better bring back the population. Hundred percent. I'm and, just joking. You know, yeah. And yeah, no, no. I think that's really true. And this is also like this leads into maybe a, a place I shouldn't go, but this is also why I'm really in favor of like geoengineering research, um, which is the idea of, of of doing these mass scale things to try and cool the climate um, uh, outside of just cutting emissions. And the, and the reason why I'm in favor of that is like I want my children to have all the information and options on the table that they can then use if they need to. You know, um, if geoengineering, which I think is actually, I think a lot of people are very skeptical that will ever be done. Like I'm kind of more like, oh yeah, I think, I think it will probably <laughs> done, be done at some point, you know, if, but I want my, if, if it is done, I think future generations should have as much good information on how to do it and how to do it in the best possible way if they need to. And maybe they have the information that says, no, this is not worth it. And they don't do it, but we should at least be exploring whatever options we can to get us through, and, and I'll use the scientific parlance that that you know to get us through this bottleneck, um, you know let's 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 have the good information and let's let's put our resources into it. Yeah, I love that, and I think that's a good place to bookmark this conversation for now because we're getting into geoengineering, which I'm sure. not smart enough to understand yet. <laughs> I, I don't always understand it, but I, there's been a lot of there's been a if, if readers are interested, and I can send you a link. There's a fascinating paper that just came out that created a firestorm of controversy and back and forth about and the argument of the paper is basically like from what they did and they did very crude kind of modeling but basically they said that we could potentially cool the earth or like cut cut global warming in half using solar geoengineering and um that that would we could do that without a ton of really bad side effects for the earth is what they argue oh, that's interesting. now a lot of yeah. Now, a lot of people disagree and people say it's not well done enough. And, and I think I think that's true in the sense that, like, we need more research and science. But a lot of people are saying we should just not do any research on geoengineering. I'm like, why would we close the door on something that could potentially um, be used as a really helpful tool down the road? But for our kids, like, just let's not close the door. Let's leave it open. So I, I'm all for, like, investment and stuff. But, like, this has opened up sort of this new discussion about geoengineering, which and if people don't know, like, geoengineering gets very, very, very little funding. It's like no one wants to touch it. Everyone's scared of it. It's like bare bones. But I'm like, I'm just like, why? Why would we not at least explore the option, if if it, if it has even the one percent chance of giving our kids a better world? Why would we not consider that? So anyway. it's definitely it's definitely interesting. And send me the link. I'll link to that in the I show will. notes. And I will definitely link to your whole new column, all the new articles you've posted thus far, for anybody that wants to learn more about the Tapir, the bottleneck, uh, generation climate, and <clears throat> all the other articles that you have coming out soon. My last two questions real quick is if you can sure. just give people a little quick highlight as to the next articles that are coming out. And also we talked a lot about if you were to invest your money into a, a conservation group, who you would give to. So if you can just provide a couple examples of who your kind of fan favorites are. Sure. So uh, uh, I think my next article is going to be on um, uh, Borneo as well. <laughs> I, I keep coming back to Borneo, apparently, on and on uh, issues of uh, rainfall and deforestation. So there's a lot of research that's been coming out showing that when we cut down forests, uh, we lose rain. Um, and that's kind of important. You know, I mean, it, the, the, you know, the agriculture in like Brazil and Indonesia and Malaysia, like if you're cutting down on your forests and your rain patterns change, well, agriculture is going to suffer. So it's going to be a piece uh, looking at that. Um, as far as who to give to it, you know, what I would say is find out, you know, what, whatever you're passionate about and find those small to medium uh, places, NGOs that are working in that region or that area and are doing some good work. Um, and that can be, you know, I, I, and like, for example, one of the, one of my favorite organizations is this organization called uh, Durrell. And they uh, run a small zoo off the coast of the UK. They've been around for a long time. They're, they were founded by Gerard Durrell, who there's a whole TV show about him now when he was a kid. But he wrote these three amazing books about how when he was a kid, he was living in Corfu and uh, just caught a bunch of animals and made his own zoo. And he was obsessed. Uh, and he's an amazing figure. But the organization is so interesting because what they do is they do a lot of work with captive breeding. And they've done a lot of work where they basically just saved these small little known species totally from extinction on their own. Um, but they're not cool. the only, yeah, it's really cool. But they're not the only groups doing that. You know, I think Health and Harmony is a really good uh, look at like what innovation can do and how you can help both humans and wildlife. Um, 
but I also, I, you know, I, I get obsessed with certain species like the Sumatran rhino or the Selenodon, and then I look at the groups that are like literally working on the ground with them. Um, another group I'll give a plug to is the uh, Zoological Society of London has this program called the EDGE program, where they track the weirdest, most evolutionary distinct species on the planet, and then they try and set up programs to help those species. Um, I've been following them for 10 years, and I'm absolutely enamored with their work and, and what they do. They send out these expeditions and really try and get and they and they hire local conservations conservationists on the ground often to do to run research and conservation programs. So I think they're really good. I think if you're interested in, in supporting a larger group, I think uh, Wildlife Conservation Society is a larger group, and I think it's one of the better larger groups. Um, they they have a really laser like focus on certain parts of the world. They do really incredible work. I know a lot of the scientists that have that uh, that work with them, and and they're just I think one of the best for just like pure old school wildlife conservation. Um, yeah, and then I would also say I guess if you're looking at donating anything to wildlife or biodiversity, also think about donating to any any kind of groups working on climate change, uh, especially on pushing our leaders uh, to do something. I think that that's going to be, <laughs> that's like the most that's important. important. Yeah. What about the Sumatran rhino specifically? So the Sumatran rhino, there's a number of groups, uh, uh, the, uh, international rhino fund or yeah. international rhino foundation, IRF works directly with them and they, they help run the sanctuary. Um, Bora, which is the Bornean rhino, um, association. They have, uh, two rhinos in Borneo right now and they do some, they've been doing some incredible work and they're actually trying you know, really high tech in vitro techniques. Uh, they've been talking about trying to do some of that to, to, to do something. Um, and then there's a whole new, uh, organization, like it's a collaboration of WWF and Nat Geo and IRF and such. And I think that's like the international or like the rhino Sumatran rhino rescue program or something, but they're, they're the ones that are heading up this new effort. So there's certainly someone to look at as well. Awesome. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much. Congrats on the new column. I'm going to link that in the show notes. Everybody else listening, definitely check it out. And I just want to say thank you again for putting me in touch with so many amazing people. And I think what's happened that's really cool with this podcast is I was always, I started this with the idea of connecting with people who know a lot more about wildlife and conservation than I do and just learning about their stories and was really excited about it. And what you've helped me do through connecting with a lot of your friends, but also through our consistent kind of communication since the podcast is really develop like friendship and community around this whole thing in a way that's like really exciting and really cool and something I never even envisioned happening. So I'm, I'm really thankful for you taking the time consistently being our first recurring guest <laughs> and really helping me elevate all of this. So thank you very much for all that you do. And yeah, I'm, I'm no super, problem. super excited to keep chatting and for everybody else listening until next time, stay wild. Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time. For all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc., please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.